The fifth generation Kia Sportage has just been released in Australia. At the launch, we recorded comments from Kia's Chief Operating Officer, their Product Manager and their General Manager of Marketing. And we talked to the independent suspension expert on his approach to tuning the ride and handling for Australian conditions. We review some of the technical features and get some comments on its distinctive style from our King of Bling correspondent, Alan from Gay Carboys. The medium SUV segment is the largest SUV category in the Australian market. It has boomed when medium-sized sedans have declined enormously. To sell so many, you have to reach a variety of potential customers, as Kia's General Manager of Marketing, Dean Norbiato, knows. There is a wide variety of people who purchase this car. It's not easy to just narrow it in and say this is the one target market, this is the one market. So you need to have different flavours and tastes to cater for the wide variety of people, whether it's grandma who buys the car, who looks after the, the grandkids, or whether it's mum and dad who are in their late 20s, early 30s, who are buying the car to look after their kids, or later in life in their mid 40s with some young kids. So it's a real widespread in the medium SUV. It is the sweet spot. Um, and we think that we found a package in a car um, that can cater for all of those. Um, and from a marketing standpoint, we're looking to cater to a wide variety of people. Kia has progressed in its exterior designs. For the new Sportage, the bow tie grille that has been a feature of Kia's for some time is replaced with a more dominant grille right across the front of the vehicle. The lights are not the squinting look of many other recent vehicles from a variety of brands but are dominated by the boomerang daylight running lights around a diamond shaped headlight cluster. Alan Zervis from Gay Carboys has some passionate feelings about this vehicle's look. I think it's daring, and I think it's going to take me a little while to get used to, but yes, I think they've made good choices. What they've done is make it stand out from the rest of the crowd. There's nothing else that looks like that. The daytime running lights are a fairly strong V-shape, which kind of points to the middle of the car. Uh, the grill, of course, is, is incredibly strong as well, though they still call it a tiger nose grill. I struggle to see the tiger nose bit, to be honest. And there's two types. There's a, a slightly more subtle lower grill in the bottom two models, but yeah, I struggle to tell the difference. With a sloping roof and several design lines, the side looks more than a boxy SUV. The rear uses some distinguishing lines and creases and a second matte tone grey for avoiding a flat and boring look. I like it. Well, what that does, of course, it's, a, it's meant to be a negative space. So it's meant to make the back of, or, or you know, whatever it's covering, it's meant to make that disappear into the distance. And I think that does it successfully. It makes the rear end of the car look quite small. Hmm. I, I think it suits the new badge particularly well. Oh, that new badge. Hated it when it first came out, but it seems to now look like it's making a statement rather than just an advertising branding. Yeah, well, I think, as they pointed out at the launch, could you imagine the old badge on this car? And well, frankly, I can't. The fifth generation Sportage is a bigger vehicle in some important areas. It's longer, it has a longer wheelbase, it's a bit wider, and it's a little higher depending on the model. The Sportage comes with three engines, each with different gearboxes. The entry level is a 2.0-litre petrol engine, not turbocharged. It's the only model in two-wheel drive and comes with either a 6-speed manual or 6-speed automatic. Reasonable power and moderate torque, it's not available in the top GT line specification. Then there's the 1.6-litre turbo, with all-wheel drive and a seven-speed dual-clutch gearbox. More power and torque, but this combination is only available in the two top specifications, the SX Plus and the GT Line. Finally, there's a two-litre diesel with all-wheel drive and an eight-speed automatic gearbox. Similar power to the turbo petrol, but heaps more torque. It's available in all four specification levels. 
The diesel is the only powertrain with a terrain select mode, giving additional traction setups for snow, mud and sand conditions. The bigger body translates into more interior space in some key areas. There's increased leg room for the second row of passengers and a larger boot space area. The first three specification levels have a good, more typical layout for the driver's instruments and the infotainment screen, but it is the top of the range GT line with what Kia calls its cinematic screen that gets most of the marketing attention. I'm not quite sure I'd agree with cinematic. I don't quite know where they've where they got that from. It sounds more like PR speak to me, but what I would call it is stylish and comfortable and elegant. It uses wide screens where the mid uh, middle of the dash infotainment screen blends into it seems to almost extend although it, they are different screens into that that in front of the driver. It's a curved screen for a start, which I think is just remarkable. Uh, we've seen similar to that in Mercedes-Benz, but not something in a, uh, dare I say, more entry-level model, more affordable model. It's curved, but the passengers can still see the infotainment screen quite easily. You're right, it's two individual 12.3-inch LCD monitors. I think it looks absolutely spectacular. And that's only on the top model, mind you. The other ones don't have those same screens. The specification levels of Kias have increased markedly in recent years, making it less of a price-driven purchase to being vehicles with the latest comfort and safety features. Here are the extra features that are standard in all variants of this fifth-generation Sportage. and the list of extra safety features that are again standard across the board is enormous. Sometimes it's the little things that count. A feature that has recently appeared in a few Kia and Hyundai models is a voice memo recorder with simple start, pause and stop functions. You then play it back when you have stopped as a reminder of the things that came to mind. As a marketing person, Dean shares an appreciation for this feature. Who thought of the idea of having a recorded memo? I love it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where the origin comes from, but I can say, like you, I'm a big fan of that because I'm so forgetful. So be, being able to put something on record and then look at it later or listen to it later is really important. And just one of those nice little touches. You know what I like? I like walking up to the car and holding the open button and the windows come down so all the heat can get out of the cabin on a hot, hot summer's day. Kia's product manager, Roland Rivero, who listens to what customers say about features such as their sound of nature, where you can select soothing sounds such as rain or birds in the forest. This is a feature that is not mentioned in every road test. Everyone's, you know, time poor and trying to rush and do all sorts of things at once these days. Uh, definitely customers are appreciating these features. Even little things like, uh, you know, we make fun of it, the sounds of nature. It actually helps soothe babies and, and put them to sleep. So the, you know, the ability to talk to the third row with the intercom function, that's also been appreciated by customers. So I think, depending on the customer type, but definitely the parents, uh, they're, they're loving some of these features. Kia Australia goes out of its way to tune the suspension of its vehicles for Australian road conditions. That may sound fairly straightforward, but the amount and complexity of the adjustments are monumental. So Kia calls in some expert help. My name's Graham Gambold. Um, I'm the director of Gambold Testing Services, and we contract to Kia Motors or Kia Australia, as it's now known, on uh, vehicle dynamics development, so suspension tuning, ride and handling, that sort of thing. When we're talking about tuning an electronic power steering software map, which is the um, assistance curve and how the steering feels in the car. With electronic steering, there are tw literally 20,000 parameter points that we can change, you know, boost curves, um, 
uh, return efforts, um, on centre build up, off centre build up. Yeah, all sorts of parameters that we can tune. It'd be like tuning fuel injection in a car. We can tune the richness and the cold start assist and all these things, and the steering's the same. In the suspension, it's not so um, so expensive, although electronic shock absorbers, which we have in our Kia Stinger, we have to tune the shock absorber, which is tune the hy hydraulic valve and all the valve componentry to get the right fluid dynamics and the right control in the car. And then on top of that, after we've done that, we then have to do a pass. Uh, electronic controlled shock absorber map, tuning map, which regulates the valve in the shock absorber to make it harder, softer, based on accelerometers, vertical and lateral accelerometers that are in the car. So we've got to write the software for all those sensor integrations with the actual performance of the damper. So they're complicated and that takes a long time. Not 20,000 parameters, but probably not far off it. But yeah, the, and electric cars, yeah, you've got all the drive torque and all that sort of thing. Power, the whole power system's controlled by computers, so you've got to tune all that too. We will do a separate video soon on Graham's comprehensive thoughts on making better handling cars. Typically SUVs are more expensive than a similar size sedan from the same manufacturer. Now the Sportage is priced, including on-road costs, from $34,700 to $55,000. No longer cheapest in the market, but with all those features, a seven-year warranty and a very credible build quality, it's certainly going to keep many brands honest. In 2021, the Kia Sportage struggled a little, with the top-selling vehicles in the medium SUV class being Toyota RAV4, Mazda CX-5, Mitsubishi Outlander, Hyundai Tucson, the Toyota RAV4 has some particularly good hybrid technology and that is accounting for a significant part of the sales. So what is happening with Kia and electrification? Now Kia says the new Sportage is inspired by nature and takes on a bold, sophisticated and organic form but there is no hybrid or pure electric version at this stage. Is the move to electrification happening as quickly as Kia thought it would? Uh I'll be quicker because I think it'd be interesting from a, from a product point of view with with Roland. No, I think it's uh, happened at the rate that I thought it would happen. I think it could have moved faster. Um, it, it it should have moved faster, in my humble opinion. But maybe I'm a little bit too cl too close to it. Um, but it needs help. It can't happen all organic. It can't all be on the OEMs to do to do that also. So things like infrastructure needs to also come into place. There needs to be some level of support in that regard because it's not easy for, every, for everybody and anybody. Um, if you're not living in a, a single dwelling house with a garage, but you're, you're in an apartment block, for example, it's not that simple. So there are things that I think need to fall into place to make it a lot easier for Australians to, to make that transition. And right now it's not, it's not there yet. But each of the individual states are doing their own thing as well. So there's not one harmonious federal position. If you leave it up to industry, what's the point of having a federal government? Well, there, there, there is a view that uh, there's nothing wrong with laissez-faire economics, uh, David, but the fact is, I think, uh, to, to uh, Roland's point, we needed a consistent coverage policy that uh, uh, told, or not told, uh, that was acceptable to 25 million people. Not one policy for 5 million people, one policy for 7 million people, one policy for 4.5 million people. I think that's, that's, that was the wrong move. But we live, we live in a, a, federal, uh, a federal environment. COVID, COVID's done that to us. I mean, governments have had their role getting rid of lead. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. would be a classic example of where it, it, it's not to necessarily totally control but even just give the environment that encourages yeah. and does, does some things that mean it encourages. Now, you know, saying that, well, I was a, a very young boy when uh, in Victoria uh, they bought in uh, compulsory seatbelts. Wearing seatbelts was, I think, was 1969. I think by memory it might have been 19, yeah, I think it was 69. It might have been 1970. And I can, you know, a lot of people were appalled by the fact that they uh, 
had to wear seat belts and well, seat belts had to be put in the cars. Mm. So, um, you know, those, those uh, things are important for governments to... Governments sometimes have to intervene. And I think that's, that's uh, Roland's point. And uh, I agree that in, in, in regards to infrastructure, governments need uh, to do more in regards to green vehicles, uh, electric vehicles. Do you see then something like the Sportage getting into hybrids and that soon? I'll well, leave that, that one for Roland too. We've, we've definitely expressed our desire. And that's, I think that's why it, it comes back to the statement or the comment I made earlier. We're always constantly telling, trying to tell our headquarters that we are a mature market and that when you're thinking of Europe, think of us as well. But we, we, we're not necessarily the case in terms of what's been happening from a green car movement perspective. Mm. So that's, that's where there's a, there's a misalignment and we're trying to tell them, if you're developing in any way for UK right-hand drive, how hard is it to add a couple of top tether anchorage points and build it for us? Kia is no longer a cheap and cheerful brand, yet the new Sportage still sets a high standard in terms of value for money. It is packed with features and drives well on a wide range of roads. I'd be happy to use it on a day-to-day -day basis and then make long trips as well. I would call its looks distinctive more than elegant, but this fifth generation Sportage is a comprehensive vehicle in what it offers in comfort, safety, handling and price.